This morning, we have a very important prophecy study that is going to be dealing with a woman, a child, and a dragon. And uh, you don't want to miss what's coming next because we're going to be going into some industrial strength Bible prophecy this week. Uh, Tonight, for example, we're going to be talking about spirits of Armageddon. And then we're going to be talking about the Antichrist. We're talking about the Judgment Day. We're talking about the beast, the seal of God, and the messages of Revelation. And I think you're going to be uh, truly blessed. And for our New York audience also, you may have heard having a special program today at 5 o'clock. We have a lot of folks that have come from around the country, and they were going to be here. And so I will be sharing my testimony. I think they're going to also put it on AFTV. I'll be sharing my testimony from 5 to 6 here, and then we're going to have a concert, a little break, and have a brief concert after that. So we've just got a full day in the Lord planned with you. Amen. All right, let's get into our study. Number 8. It's dealing with the subject of a woman, a child, and a drag. And I just want to mention, because there are people who tune in for the first time at each study, they may not know, the presentations that I'm sharing with you, they go through a question-answer format. They're filled with Scripture. You can look them up for yourself, and you'll end up with 15 lessons and one bonus program at the end of this series. We'll provide a nice folder. Those here, you were giving them to you as a gift. The people who are watching, just go to prophecyodyssey.com. You can download the lessons, and as you've heard, they're going to be in many different languages. So make the most of that. I have my lesson here on the screen. makes it easier to go through it with you very quickly. The study today is based on Revelation chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, you may want to thumb your way there right now or on your Bible device that you're holding, beginning with a really amazing fact. In 1954, a four-year-old girl was abducted abducted from her home in Colombia in the mountains and with the idea of kidnapping her and asking for a ransom, we don't know exactly what went wrong, but something went wrong and they didn't want to kill the child, so they took her off down a logging road in the jungle and they let her go, four years old. And, of course, uh, she, she, she cried and mourned for a while, and she didn't struggle so much with thirst because it did rain frequently. There was water there, and the climate was somewhat mild, and so she did not freeze. But she wandered around and looked for food, and eventually a group of capuchin monkeys were intrigued with her, and they began to drop food. She lived in the jungle, for five years. It's just an amazing story. Uh, Often tormented by insects, eventually she wore her clothes off. She followed this troop of monkeys that were watching her from the tree that kind of adopted her. She even got to the place where she could climb pretty well and uh, learned to forage for food and she stayed alive when she was finally found after these years of living in the jungle, she lost all of natural social inhibitions. She had no clothes. She'd forgotten how to speak her na- language. She didn't remember her name. And they did not ever find her real parents. They gave her the name Marina. She eventually was young enough where she could still learn, relearn to speak both English and Spanish. She moved to Britain. She was married. And all of this is contained in a fascinating book called the girl with no name. God provided for her in the wilderness in a miraculous way. Right now, she's nearly 70 years old, and she can still climb trees. You know, the Bible talks about a woman, which is a symbol for the church, and we have a true woman and a counterfeit woman in Revelation 12 and Revelation 17. We're going to study a very important subject. There are Christians all over the world, go to different churches. How do you know? Does it matter what church? Is there a true church? Do you even need to go to church? We're going to find out what people on the street think about this subject. And so let's take a look at uh, some of their comments. I guess, I guess you don't really know, right? I guess just whatever feels best for each person, right? I think it really depends. I think um, a lot of religions have a lot of different things, but I think Revelation is one of the important things. I think there's only so much that Old Testaments and old things can predict. You know, there's only so many coincidences, I feel like. 
I guess typically it would be how you're raised originally. And then uh, as you get older, you do your own investigation. When I grow up with? I think you just gotta go back to whatever your parents are and stick with that, don't change it. How do you know what churches are false? Well, it depends on depends which God you're, God you're into, really, doesn't it? People just need to pray a lot and, and you know, get some discernment, read, uh, do their own research, uh, read their own literature, and that's probably the best way. We don't. Every church has its flaw. You believe what you believe in your soul, and that's how you live. Well, what, how can a church be false? It may, it may not appeal to you or to another. Like if there's no cross in the top or like, no like religious science i don't believe so i i wouldn't i wouldn't say it matters too much i believe it does only because uh the bible preaches baptism for admission of sins and so i believe you must be baptized and there's a lot of um churches that don't teach that no doesn't just have the same if it's the same bible it's, it's fine not really at least you're attending church and believe in something does truth matter? Most important question that was ever asked was when Pontius Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? And then he walked away from Jesus and did not wait for the answer. He was standing there in front of the person who is the embodiment of truth. He said, what is truth? And with cynicism, he walked away figuring nobody can really know the truth. And you can tell from the answers that we've uh, been hearing some people say, well, you've got your truth and I've got my truth and there is really no absolute truth. Whatever you believe is good for you and what I believe is good for me. How many of you would like to go to a doctor that's doing brain surgery on you and have him say, well, I think it's a brain, but he thinks it's a cantaloupe. So, you know, whatever, whatever you believe is okay. Or when you're on the airplane and you're flying across the ocean and the pilot comes on the air and says, I realize that some of you think there are absolute laws of aerodynamics, but you know, I'm, I'd like to try an experiment. I think this plane will work just fine as a submarine because I believe it and I'm sincere. Would you want to get on that airplane? Or how many of you want to know that that pilot has learned there are certain absolute rules of aerodynamics and aviation. And if you violate those rules, there are terrible consequences because it's unforgiving. There is absolute truth regarding God and eternal life. This notion that has become popular in society that, well, you got your truth and I got my truth and who can know what truth is? It's not what the Bible teaches. God says, thy word is truth. That's what Jesus said. There is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Don't believe the devil's lie that it doesn't really matter. And as long as you're sincere, how many of you have been sincere and you found out you were wrong and it didn't help that you were sincere? I was driving cross country one time, going from California to Texas. Late at night, finally needed some gas, got off on the clover leaf and looped around. This is before you had GPS. I looped around a couple of times and I found the gas station. I filled up and I got back on the freeway and I was feeling pretty good that I was going to make great progress. But as I was going down Interstate 10, I kept seeing the signs that said Interstate 10. I said, I'm on the right interstate. But then I started saying, well, they must have a chain of those restaurants everywhere because I just saw one a few miles back. And I realized I was looking at the same restaurant and it said Interstate 10 West. Well, I'm going to Texas. I needed to be going east. I had been perfectly happy and sincere, but I was never going to get to Texas going the wrong direction. It didn't matter how sincere I was. And there's a lot of people in the world today, they think, well, it doesn't really matter as long as you're sincere. Oh, it does matter, friends, what you believe. The truth will set you free. There is a truth and knowing the truth and every element of Bible truth makes you freer. So number one, first question, how does Revelation picture God's true church? Turn to your Bibles. We're going to read it first. Turn to Revelation chapter 12, please. We'll read a few verses here. 
We're going to be going through most of this chapter in our study this morning. And now a great sign appeared, verse 1, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland, that means a crown, a stefa, it's a Stephanos, with twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. This woman is great with child. And another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads. How many heads? Seven heads and ten horns. How many horns? And seven crowns on his heads, and his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven, and he threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days fed in the wilderness. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to go back to the Bible in just a moment. So the answer, Revelation chapter 12, uh, what does it say about this woman? It says a what? A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars being with what? <clears throat> with child, she cried out in labor. She's going through labor pains and in pain to give birth. And she bears a male child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Who do you think that is? <clears throat> that male child is Jesus, the Christ. He is caught up to God's throne. We know Jesus ascended to heaven. Who is the woman? What does a woman represent? In the Bible, when it talks about this woman, she may appear here before it's over with, a woman represents God's bride, God's church. Amen? Here we are. I'm in the woman's dress. I've got to back up. And this woman, who's great with child, is a symbol of the church. What is she wearing? She's clothed with the what? The sun. That's the light of God's truth that you find in the New Testament. Standing on the moon. Does the moon give light at night? Does the moon have light of its own, or does the moon reflect the light of the sun that will rise? It is the Old Testament reflecting the light of the sun of righteousness who would arise with healing in his wings. The New Testament church stands on the foundation of the promises of God in the Old Testament. And above her head, above the head is a symbol of leadership. You've got the 12 stars, and that represents the 12 tribes in the Old Testament. You've got the 12 apostles in the New Testament. You even have the 12 princes of Moses leading Israel, the 12 judges of Israel in the book of Judges, 12 a symbol of leadership. This is God's church. He is clothed with sun moon, stars. Who made the sun? Who made the moon? Look at Genesis. Who made the stars? This is God's light. The Bible says to the bride, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So this woman represents the true church. Okay? It says, and how do we know that? You read in Jeremiah 6, 2. God's church is symbolized by woman. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and a delicate woman. The sun representing the light of Jesus, Psalm 84, Malachi 4.2, giving you these verses. The moon represents the promises in the history of the Old Testament, which the church was built on. This will all be in your lesson. The stars above her head symbolize the leadership of the church. And... Uh, you read about the stars, it says there in Revelation chapter 1, which were the ministers of the church. It was leadership. The one who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron, this man-child, is Jesus. Amen? And the dragon wants to devour the man-child as soon as it's born. Now, you see this woman, but she's juxtaposed against a different woman than you find in Revelation 17. Okay, back to our Bibles. Go in your Bible to Revelation chapter 17. We're going to start with verse 3. And you'll find that these two women are they're actually opposites. And um, this woman exists in the world today too. Revelation 17, start with verse 3. So he, the angel, carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman 
sitting on a scarlet colored beast that was full of names of blasphemy having how many heads? Seven heads and how many horns? Now, when was the last time you saw a beast with seven heads and ten horns? They're not that common, are they? How many would agree this is the same beast? By the way, it appears in Revelation 13, too. This beast who is trying to destroy the woman in Revelation 12 is in cooperation with the woman in Revelation 17. What is a woman? Church. So you've got one woman clothed with God's light, but this woman, it says she's arrayed, and this is verse 4, purple, scarlet, adorned with gold, precious stones, pearls, all things you would find on earth that can be man-made. Having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And if you have any doubt about this woman, she's got on her forehead, people have things in their forehead in Revelation, she's got this stamp, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. She's got daughters that have come out of her and of abominations of the earth and the woman is drunken with the blood of the saints. So this is the wrong woman. You got these two women. So a woman represents what? Can we use the Bible and Bible prophecy to try and find out if God has a people in the world today? Is the Bible pretty clear there is the true woman of light and there is a counterfeit? One is riding with the beast the other's being persecuted by the beast. Does it matter what church you're in? You don't want to be with that woman in Babylon because you read Revelation chapter 18, 19, it says Babylon is going to be destroyed. That harkens back to the Tower of Babel, man-made worship that was confused and cursed by God there in Genesis chapter 11. These are the keys to understanding these things. It says, a woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. So you've got this woman riding a beast in Revelation 17. This beast is a great persecuting power that we find. If we go from chapter 12 to chapter 13, you're going to see that beast appears again. All right, number two. Who is the great red dragon? And what does he try to do? Now we're going back to chapter 12. That great dragon was cast out called the serpent of old, called what? The devil. the devil and Satan. So it's saying that the devil is manipulating this power, this beast. Now, you, when you read in Isaiah 14, it describes the devil, but it uses the king of Tyre. If you look in Ezekiel 28, it talks about the devil but he's working through the king of Babylon. When you read Revelation 12, it talks about the devil, but he's operating through the kingdom of pagan Rome. It says the dragon tries to devour the man-child as soon as he is born. The dragon stood before the woman who's ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it is born. So this dragon is an enemy of Christ wants to destroy Christ. You know, there's several times in Bible history when the devil has tried to stop the Savior from coming. Now, the devil knew that the Messiah would come. He knew the incarnation would happen. He didn't know exactly when. When the children of Israel were in Egypt, he thought now would be the time when God would send the Savior. So what did he do? The dragon tried to destroy all the male baby boys. Do you remember the Pharaoh was telling them to throw all the baby boys to the crocodiles in the Nile River? But Moses is, sa is spared. One is spared. He becomes a savior. Do you know back during the time of Athaliah, if you know your Bible, if you get to 2 Kings, it tells about a wicked queen. She's the daughter of Jezebel, another wicked queen. By the way, in the time of Jezebel and Athaliah, there is a three and a half year period, 1,260 days just like Revelation. And her son, Ahaziah, is killed in battle by Jehu. She does not want one of the sons of David to rule. Athaliah is a pagan. Her mother, Jezebel, is a pagan. She wants to be queen. Well, among the Jews, they had kings. They didn't have queens. The men ruled. So, but she wants to be queen. So she kills all of the babies of David, the descendants of David. 
She kills all of her grandchildren. Boy, talk about cold-blooded. But one escapes. His name is Joash. And he ends up being in the temple of God. He comes out of the temple of God when he's seven years old. They blow the trumpets. They coronate him king. She is destroyed. Something like when Jesus, our Savior, the Son of David Christ, is going to come from the heavenly temple. The trumpets will blow. The people will rejoice and Babylon's destroyed. What you see happening in the Bible is going to be repeated in the future. This is what Revelation is talking about. So the devil under Herod using the Roman power. How many remember when Herod sent his soldiers to Bethlehem? They said, well, there's a baby. He's a new king of the Jews. You know what Herod's official title was? The Romans gave him the title king of the Jews. So when the wise men come into Jerusalem, they said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And Herod said, what did you say? He said, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I'd like to know about when you find him. Tell me when you find him. I would like to worship him too. He wanted to kill him. The devil was working, the dragon, through pagan Rome. And then later you find the devil starts working through the church papal Rome during the Dark Ages. Number three, what happens after Satan fails to destroy Jesus? You know, did the devil try to destroy Jesus on the cross? Did he try to keep him in the tomb? Could the devil keep him in the tomb? Did Christ ascend to heaven? Now the devil cannot hurt Jesus anymore, can he? He's out of his reach. So what does the devil do now? It says her child is caught up to God in his throne. As the disciples watch in Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascended and he's caught up in a cloud of angels. And the Bible said that as he left, he will come. Amen? He's coming in the clouds with all of the angels of heaven. But in the meantime, the devil now vents his fury. The devil wants to hurt Jesus by hurting what Jesus loves. If you want to hurt somebody, you don't just torture them, but torture their child in front of them. I remember once when one of our boys was 18 months old, he had spinal meningitis. They didn't know, so they had to do a test called a spinal tap. But because we had come to the doctor off hours, they had an intern there that was in training. They call it practicing medicine. And we watched as the hospital staff held down our beautiful 18-month baby boy, and he tried to push the needle into his spine and find the right spot to drain out spinal fluid. And our little boy, they can't numb them at the time, and our little boy's looking up with his eyes wild with tears. He's going, Daddy, 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 why are you letting them hurt me? And it broke my heart. I would have traded places with him just like that. The devil knows that Jesus loves us. He wants to hurt Jesus by hurting his people. That's why he persecutes the church. After Jesus is caught up to heaven, what does Satan do to the church? When the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the child. After Christ ascended to heaven, some of the most severe persecution came upon the church. How many of you have heard the stories of what Nero and Diocletian and the different Roman emperors did to the Christians in the Colosseums? It's not just the fables. They were fed to wild beasts. Nero smeared pitch on the Christians and lit them on fire alive to light his gardens as they writhed in pain. It was terrible. Why do you think the catacombs are under Rome? Because they had to go underground, so to speak. It was called religio illicite. Even in the Bible, you can see where Paul and the Jews had been expelled from Rome by the emperor. See, the, the Roman Empire had tolerated many religions as long as you still held up the Roman religion as supreme. But when the Christians said, no, we're not going to offer incense to your pagan gods, they outlawed the religion, and it became religio illicite. That's why Paul says it may, may be better if you don't get married and have a family right now because of the persecution is so intense. So the devil tried to destroy the church with plan A. Plan A was annihilation, extermination, genocide. Feed them to the lions, kill them off in the mines, work them to death, crucify them. 
When Nero burned Rome, he blamed it on the Christians. Nero burned Rome because he didn't like the wooden tenements. He wanted marble structures, and he thought, I got to get rid of all these poor people. He set the city on fire, watched it burn, played his fiddle. You've heard the story. And when they were outraged, he said, the Christians did it. He said, by the way, you know, the Christians, they're living underground, and they're cannibals. They, they believe in eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Jesus. They're cannibals, and they had terrible propaganda against Christians, and the Christians experienced a terrible persecution. Not only that, during this time, the Jews rebelled against the Romans, and people saw Christianity and Judaism. They kept the same Sabbath. They worshiped the same God. They read the same Bible. They saw them as sort of the same thing. And so the Jews became very hated after 70 A.D., and so Judaism and Christianity were both outlawed and Christians and Jews were being exterminated in mass. Destroyed, enslaved, property taken away, scattered around the empire. But you know what happened? The seed of Christianity is the blood of the martyrs. The more they mowed them down, the more they grew. Because the pagans would come to the Colosseum and they'd watch these Christians before they're being fed to wild animals calmly pray. They had expressions of peace and joy. They looked like they were on their way to a wedding because they knew their next conscious thought was the resurrection and seeing the Lord. And they said, why are they so peaceful? Why are they so brave? And they started asking questions and Christianity kept spreading. And the devil said, this is not working. So he went to plan B. Was if you can't destroy them from the outside, destroy them from the inside. He legalized Christianity and he commingled paganism and Christianity. Constantine, ostensibly, he legalized Christianity. And he said, yeah, well, my mother is converted to Christianity, so I can't kill them off. They're really not hurting anybody. And all of a sudden, it became very vogue to be a Christian. And so what happened is, and you can read here in question number five, where did the woman go during this terrifying period of persecution and how long did it last? Now let me tell you what happened and then we'll get to the answer. So with the conversion of Constantine and Christianity being legalized and suddenly it's very popular, all over Rome they had all these pagan priests. Constantine said Christianity's legalized, his mother became a Christian, and the pagan priest said, I'd like to stay on the government payroll. I'll be a Christian. And all of these pagans began to join the church before they were converted or even taught. In fact, when Constantine was fighting the Battle of Maximilian and he came to the Tiber River, he claimed to see a vision where he was to conquer under the sign of the cross. And they began to paint red crosses on their shields. And he ordered his army, for good luck, to march through the Tiber River and he says, I I'm going to baptize the whole lot of you. March through the river. Well, they had not been taught. And so you got all of these dry pagans that go through the river, and they come up wet pagans, but they're being told, you're Christians now. They have no idea what that means. And they have all these idols all over Rome. They had more idols than tiles on the rooftop in Rome. And they said, well, what do we do with our idols? And they said, well, let's change their names. Give them Christian names. And Diana, we'll call her Mary. And Jupiter, Apollo, Mercury, Peter, James, and John. And all of a sudden, idolatry just swept into the church. And the priests, instead of being like the people, you know, Jesus did not dress in special vestments. They'd, he dressed like a carpenter. But now they started to, priests were an upper class. And they said, you know, we better not give the Bibles to the people. If you give the Bibles to the people, they're going to find out uh, salvation is a gift, and we've been selling it. And if they want forgiveness, they've got to pay indulgences to the church. And all of a sudden, the priests became a special class. And they were living in palaces. And the people were being ground down, and the religion became a government institution. That's how the capital of Christianity moved from Jerusalem to Rome. You still with me? This is history, friends. I mean, anybody can look this up. 
And all of a sudden, there was tremendous compromise. And what you had is there were still many sincere Christians that were in Rome, and they were fighting against the compromise. But all of a sudden, you had the commingling of Christianity and paganism. They started saying hell burns forever because they got that from Greek mythology with uh, Pluto. And they started um, saying you, have to, you can pay for your sins, salvation by works. Everything began to change. True Christians began to get persecuted. By the time of Justinian, about 538 A.D., Justinian, the Roman emperor, he said, I'm moving the capital of Constantinople. I'm going to give the bishop of Rome is now going to be the head of the church. We're going to call him the Supreme Papa, the Father, the Pope. That happened years after Jesus. Jesus never said Peter was the leader of the church. Jesus is the leader of the church. In fact, right after Jesus says, Peter, yeah, because of your declaration that I'm the Messiah, on that rock of your declaration, I'm going to build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it, and I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to die. And Peter said, no, no, Lord, don't do that. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. In the same passage where people say he's the first pope, Jesus calls him Satan. Totally misunderstood. So, Christians had to flee into the wilderness. Notice, the woman, now we're still in Revelation 12. You tracking with me? The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. A time of great persecution happened because the church in Rome became a government institution that not only ruled over Rome, they began to rule over all of the empires under the Roman Empire. And with the conversion of Clovis, the king of the Franks, you had the Holy Roman Empire. And how many of you have played chess? You got the king and the queen, and who is on the right of the king and the queen? Bishop? Bishop. You look at the churches all through Europe during that time of history, and you had the king and the queen, and then you had the church. And they had to clear everything with the church. And if the king and the queen did not clear it with the church, then the whole nation could be excommunicated. And the reason that you've got the Church of England is because Henry kept killing his wives because they couldn't have children. And the church said, look, enough is enough. You've killed five or six wives, you know. We can't approve your divorce. He said, well, then I'm just going to start my own church. And the Church of England broke away. Because the, and the whole nation was excommunicated at that time. And so the church had tremendous power over Europe during this time. True Christians that read the Bible for themselves had to flee into the mountains. They went into the Italian and the Swiss Alps and they kept the purity of the faith and they would copy out the scriptures by hand and they'd send their merchants and their children into town to give little sections of scripture to people to spread the faith and keep it alive. But the church clothed in sackcloth is what Revelation says. You know what sackcloth is? When I was a kid, we had potato bags. You don't have them anymore. They're plastic now. How many remember burlap bags? It's kind of cloth, but it's cheap cloth, and light can still get through it, but it's obscured. And the church, the light of the church was obscured during that time. Had to go underground. You know how long it lasted? From 538, when the Pope became the supreme ruler, it was given an army, and Christianity was enforced by an army. Jesus never told us to force people to be Christians. Until Napoleon came along in 1798, the Pope was arrested, they lost their universal power, and he died in captivity. From 538 to 1798, you've got 1,260 years. It says for 1,260 days, 42 months, a time, a time, and the dividing of time, that time period is in prophecy many times. By the way, what is God's number in the Bible? God's number. Seven. What is half of seven? Three and a half. It usually represents a time of persecution. How long did Jesus preach? Three and a half years and then he died. And then the apostles preached for three and a half years and then Stephen was killed exactly three and a half years later. And you look at the story in the Old Testament of Elijah. For three and a half years, Elijah preached and the prophets had to go underground. They were hidden in caves until he had his Mount Carmel experience. And even then, he had to 
great persecution, Elijah had to run from his life from Jezebel, a woman. I'm talking about a woman representing the church. She was a pagan woman that married a Jewish king. The combination of paganism and the truth was persecuting the prophets of God. What happened in the Old Testament was repeated in history and it's going to happen again in the last days. Is it making sense? All right, so she flees into the wilderness. Number six, what two other identifying marks, oh, well, I'm sorry, what are two other identifying marks of God's true church? You get down to the end of chapter 12, it says, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest. That means the remnant of her offspring who do what? Keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus. If you read in Isaiah chapter 8, it says, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. The law and the testimony. Read in Revelation 19 verse 10. John is talking to an angel. He falls down to worship the angel. The angel says, don't worship me. Don't worship anyone but God. We're not to pray to angels. We're not to pray to statues. Say amen. He says, pray to God. You don't even pray to angels. And the angel said, fear God. I am of your fellow servants who keep the testimony of God. For the testimony of God is the spirit of prophecy. The law and the testimony. The law and the prophets. Two characteristics. Read in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. According to the law and the testimony, the word of God, if they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them. The word of God is dual in nature. Ten commandments, two tables of stone. You've got the Bible, the New and the Old Testament. These are the two witnesses in Revelation 11. We'll get to that another time. Symbolized by Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. And God's people will have the word of God. Now you might say, well, yeah, every church keeps the commandments. Some of them. Oh, no, no, friends. God's looking for people that will believe in all ten. God does not call them the ten suggestions. They are not called the ten good ideas. They are not God's ten recommendations. They are the ten commandments of God. Amen? Everybody in jail keeps some of them some of the time. You keep them when you're sleeping for a few hours each night. And even then you might be dubious. God is looking for people that believe in all ten. Amen? Keeping not just the letter, but keeping the spirit of the law as well. Amen? So the dragon especially hates that group of people. Number seven, how did Jesus say that we're to demonstrate our love for him? He said what? If you love me, honk your horn. I heard about a woman that um, she was stuck in traffic and she began to honk her horn and shake her fist. Didn't know that the policeman was behind her. He jumped out of his car and he pulled his gun and he said, get out of your car, hands up, up against the car. He searched her, checked her ID. She said, what's all that about? He said, well, I saw the way that you were gesturing to the driver in front of you, and I heard you honking your horn, and I saw your bumper sticker. It said, honk if you love Jesus. I just figured you stole the car. <clears throat> we need to be living it too, amen? amen? The Bible says, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Isn't it all about love, friends? Amen? amen. Number eight. What three angelic messages will God's end time church be preaching to the world? Answer, the, and you read about this in Revelation 14. Go to your Bible real quick. <clears throat> in Revelation 14, you're going to notice that something unique happens here. It tells us that Jesus comes in Revelation 14, verse 14. You can see here where it says, Then I looked. Behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud one sat like the Son of Man. Remember, he'd been caught up, chapter 12. Now he's coming back. On his head a golden crown, in his hand a sharp sickle. He's coming to harvest the earth. It's the great judgment day. What message goes to the world before Jesus comes? Look in chapter 14. Starts with verse 6. Gives three angel messages. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel 
to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation. It's going to be international, every nation, every tongue, tribe, people. With a loud voice, it's going to go by radio and television, by internet. Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come. We have a lesson on that coming tomorrow night. Worship Him that made, calling us back to the Creator and the Sabbath truth, the springs and the earth and the sea and the waters. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, the same will drink the wine of the wrath of God that is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. You don't want to get the mark of the beast. Amen. We've got a lesson coming on that, friends. You don't want to make that mistake. So let's look at those three angels' mes messages quickly. Number one, fear God. And you'll see him on the screen. Say the answer with me. Fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Do you realize that's the end of time? Do you know that part of God's judgment happens before he even gets here? How do you know that? It says, Behold, I come. My reward is with me to give to every man. Does God know who's going up and who's not when he comes? Some judgment happens. Judgment must begin at the house of God. If judgment begins at us, what will be the end of them that obey not the gospel? I'm quoting the Bible. Judgment has come. Second angel's message. And worship him. I know sometimes it's not on the screen yet. What's it say? Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea. And that means worship him the right way, the right day. True worship of God. Is there a lot of counterfeit worship today? There's some people, bless their hearts, they go to church and these pastors deceive them. They say, send me your money and God's going to get you a new pickup truck. Right? Just they, they, they take advantage of people. Counterfeit worship. Answer, be, next one. And it says, another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. There will be a judgment on the people that are in Babylon, but God wants to save Babylon. He's got his people in Babylon. Now, why does it talk about that? During the time of Jeremiah, King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, conquered Jerusalem, brought the Jews to Babylon, and they were there for 70 years. How comfortable would you be for 70 years? We're only here for three weeks in New York City, and Karen and I have gotten real comfortable in our hotel room. We just may stay. But after 70 years, when God said, you're free now to go back, they said, well, we kind of like it in Babylon. We've learned the language. We've learned the customs. We're a little Babylonish ourselves. And he couldn't get his people out of Babylon. He said, but judgment's coming on Babylon. The Persians are going to destroy them. You don't want to be there. Go home. And God is telling his people in Babylon today, they're mixed up in false religions, false churches. Babylon is going to fall. The plagues will fall on Babylon. The seven last plagues come out of her, my people. Jesus has his people in Babylon. He's calling them out. And a third angel followed them saying, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will drink the wine of the wrath of God. And that's that same wine Babylon has made people drunk with her wine. Number nine, to whom will God's church preach these messages in the last days? Where does it go? The everlasting gospel. Having the everlasting gospel to preach to who? Every nation. Now, we've just shown you tonight, man, amazing facts. We're just one ministry. Amazing facts right now, just through this one program, is broadcasting into 15 different language groups. There are 8 billion people in the world today 7 billion people speak one of those languages as a first or a second language. And we're just one Christian ministry. Jesus said the gospel will be preached in all the world. Then the end will come. Friends, you're living in the generation that will see that fulfillment, I believe. Are you ready for Jesus to come? What specific specifications has God given in his word to help us identify his end time church? Well, Let's look at what some of the criteria are. 
Answer A, let's reevaluate what we just read in our study. It's going to appear and do its visible work after it emerges from the wilderness in 1798. Now, I just got to stop here and just say something to you. I believe that God's got a remnant. You know what a remnant is? It's the remainder. How many of you ladies have ever done any sewing? You go to the store and you buy a, a remnant. When I take my wallet out, everyone gets real quiet for some reason. Okay, I've got, what do I got here? I got a $10 bill. All right. When they make cloth at the factory on the loom, they get the bolt, you know, the cardboard tube, and they begin to roll the cloth onto the cardboard tube, right? What goes on first? And they roll it all up, and then they, people come to the store, and they say, I'd like to buy some, and they buy little pieces, and they cut it off, and they buy what they need for their pillows and their curtains, and they cut off the cloth. And finally, someone will say, well, I only need so much, and they got this little piece left over, and what's it called? It's a remnant. It's what's, it's what's at the end. But you know what's at the end? It's what went on first. What comes off at the end is what went on first. God's church in the last days is going to be following the scriptures the way the church did in the beginning. Amen. The Bible says we are going to return to the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Amen. The Bible tells us that there'll be a remnant. God saved a remnant in the days of Noah, right? He saved a remnant called Abraham from Babel, Ur of the Chaldees. He saved a remnant, a remnant out of Babylon. And after the persecution of 1260 years and the church went underground, there was a great revival movement that took place about 150 years ago where Christians from all different backgrounds said, let's find out what the Bible really says. Jesus does not want us divided by, by our denominations. Let's pray for the Spirit and open the Word and kneel and spend nights in prayer and get back to the Bible. That was the birth of the movement that's bringing you the seminar. Now, you say, well, what church is that? I don't like to call it a denomination, but we're, we're called Seventh-day Adventists. I don't often say it because I don't like to brag about it, but I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. It's very simple. It means we believe in keeping all the commandments, including the Seventh, and we believe Christ is coming back. It's the blessed hope, and we're telling people, get ready, get ready, get ready. Amen. And we are, do you know, North America, Seventh-day Adventist Church is voted as the most diverse church ethnically in that we have people from all different backgrounds Amen. and it is the fastest growing Protestant church in the world today Amen. and they have the biggest educational system second to the Catholic Church they have the biggest medical system second to the Catholic Church and they're spreading everywhere because people are saying hey if you're gonna be a Bible Christian where else are you gonna go come I'll share you my testimony with you a little bit later today you'll understand how this happened to me because I certainly didn't grow up this way I studied all different churches to find out I said I don't care I just want to know what does the Bible say because I want when someone says why do you believe I don't want to say well it's what my church believes what does your church believe well my church believes like my pastor what does your pastor believe like my church <laughs> what does your pastor and your church believe same thing I believe People don't know what they believe, do they? We got to go by the Bible, friends. Amen? This church began during that time period. It's following the 798 year time period. It says, answer B, it'll teach the same truths the apostles taught. We mentioned that. Answer C, it will keep the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath. Amen? Answer D, it will have the spirit of prophecy. It goes by the law and the prophets and believes in all the gifts of the spirit, friends. Amen? Amen. I believe the power of God is still alive today. It'll proclaim God's three-time, end-time message with a loud voice. It'll be a global, international church. It's not a local corner fellowship. It is an international movement. We meet that criteria. It'll teach the everlasting gospel, which is salvation through Christ alone, which is what we teach and believe. Now, Jesus, number 11, he gives us these seven prophetic identifying points. He says, go find my church. What is the promise of Jesus if we seek? Seek and you will find. Where do we search? In the Word. You run to and fro through the Word of God. 
How many church organizations in the world will fit these seven points? The Bible says there is one Lord, one faith. How many? One faith. God wants His people united on truth. One baptism. Since there's so many different churches in the world today and so many different denominations call themselves the truth, does that make them God's true church? No. Read Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1. And in that day, seven women, what's a woman represent? Will take hold of one man, Jesus, the Son of Man, saying, we'll eat our own bread, our own word of God. We'll wear our own apparel, our own righteousness. Only let us call ourselves by your name. We're going to call ourselves Christian to take away our reproach. There are more different churches that call themselves Christians that don't follow the Bible than any other religion. Christianity is the most divided because it's the genuine and the devil is fighting it. But there is a truth, friends. Amen. Based on God's word, Jesus said in the last days, wolves would come in not sparing the flock. So once a person discovers God's true end time church, it isn't necessary to become a member. And the Lord added to the, who added to the church? The Lord added to the church, his body, daily, those who were being saved. Jesus had the 12 apostles, and then later he numbered 70 disciples, and then they went, and it counts when they joined, 3,000, then 5,000. God has his people. Number 15, how many ways of escape were there in Noah's day? Jesus said it'll be like it was in the days of Noah. By faith, Noah built a fleet of arks. No. He prepared an ark. One. One Lord, one faith. For the saving of his household, Christ has an ark in the last days, friends. There's a boat, and he wants you to be part of his people. Since there are many sincere Christians in other churches, and there's one remnant church, what is God going to do in the last days? He says, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. See, I believe there are sincere Christians in different churches. Amen. Them also I must bring. What does Christ say he's doing in the last days? I must bring them. They will hear my voice. How? Through his word. And there will be how many? There can be one fold, one shepherd. All men, Jesus said, will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. Before God pours out the Spirit on his people in the last days, there's going to be a coming together of his people on the word of God. Do you believe that? How can we witness to this lost world when Christians are so divided? But we're not to unite for the sake of unity. That's what the beast is going to do. We're to unite based on truth. Amen. Based on a thus saith the Lord. Babylon the great is fallen. Come out of her my people. God is calling his children out of Babylon. And maybe you hear him calling you. Jesus calling you today to enter the safety of his great end time church. You are very precious to him, friends, and he wants you to be safe. Now, I'm going to make an invitation, a decision right now. I'd like to have our ushers, our row hosts, we got a card we want to give you. It's one thing for me to preach these things, but it's something else for people to say, that's the truth, and today, while I'm hearing his voice, I'm going to do something. You at home can participate too. You can download this card right from the internet. And you're going to see that there's four questions on the card. I want to invite John to come out and sing a verse while you put your information on your card, and we'll talk about that. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. A place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, send from the heart of God. Hold us who wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. Amen. 
How many of you sense God's spirit and presence here speaking? We've given you a card, Spanish one side, English locally. You can download them at home. Four simple questions. I'm inviting you to make a decision. Question number one. I have accepted Jesus as my personal Savior, and I desire to follow him where he leads. Is your answer yes? Mark it on your card, please. Question number two. I see from the Bible that God has a remnant people in these last days. Is that clear, that he has a people? God has not changed. Mark, yes, you believe that. Here's the important one. I desire to worship in spirit and truth and I would like to join God's remnant church. You want to know, how do I become part of that body, this movement that is sweeping around the world? Mark yes there if God's Spirit is speaking to you. And the fourth question, if you've got questions about this that you'd still like to better understand, then go ahead and mark that down. Please put down your contact information. No one's going to hassle you, but we want to pray with you, friends. Now, as we go off the air, I'm going to be having prayer with our New York audience. Those of you who are leading your groups around the world, we hope you'll pray with your group. This meeting is going to just get better and better from here on. You don't want to miss the programs that are coming. We're going to be talking tonight about the spirits of Armageddon, something happening in the world today. You don't want to miss that. Tomorrow is the judgment. Testimony here, 5 o'clock today, and a little concert to follow. But we don't want you to miss that, friends. After you fill in your cards, please pass them back to the aisles and you can send your cards to us, those watching online. God bless you. We'll see you tonight.